Okay, colleagues, I think we should start our meeting, so please be seated. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we are already five minutes later, so the topic of our meeting, this is the public hearing of European Digital Identity Wallet and Trust Services, and uh, uh, this is, uh, mm, as you know, ITRE committee is currently working on the amending proposal that will establish the European Digital Identity Wallet and introduce new trust services. Uh, this is an important step toward uh, digitalization of the Union, that it is that is people-centered. Therefore, today's discussion is very important for us and we are glad to have a panel of experts that will give uh, their views on this topic. I would like to welcome Mr. Wojciech Wiewiórowski, mm. European Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. Alban Ferro, uh, President of Eurosmart, Mr. Professor Kai Rannenberg, Chair of Mobile Business and Multilateral Security at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Mr. Thomas Loninger, Executive Director of Digital Rights, NGO Epicenter Works and Vice President of EDRI. And Ms. Catalina Dodu, Member of the Employment Employers Association of the Software and Services Industry. And uh, each uh, expert will have uh, for seven, seven minutes for the presentation. We have uh, two hours for this hearing uh, after the presentation by our invited speakers. Uh, we have, will have two rounds of the questions and ans answers. In the first round, the floor will be given to the ITRA Rapporteur and Shadows. Uh, and also to the rapporteurs of the associated uh, committees. In the second round, the floor will be open to the other ITRA members. Uh, and the speaker list, uh, as always, has been circulated ahead of the meeting, and uh, I would like to ask kindly our speakers to stick to the allocated time. So we start now um, uh, with the presentation by Mr. Wojciech Wiewiórski for seven minutes. So I give you and the, the floor you will, Mr. Wiewiórski will be connected uh, remotely. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome from Brussels as well, from the Office of the European Data Protection Supervisor. I'm really very happy to be uh, in the ITRIET Committee, and uh, I would like to thank for the invitation and for the opportunity to exchange the views on this important proposal uh, the proposal, which in our opinion is one of the leading uh, right now on the table of the EU institutions. Uh, EDPS has taken part in the consultation of this uh, process, and uh, I would like to express my full support to the idea of the European Dig Digital Identity Wallet <clears throat> and the trust services which are connected with it. I can even see several data protection benefits which are associated with this ambitious project. Of course, there are many challenges as well, uh, which I will address uh, later on. Let me start with benefits. I'm always the optimist and I always see the glass half full. Uh, first of all, EDPS welcomes the European Digital Identity Wallet. Uh, will give the user the better transparent control on what the data is shared and with whom, and also for what purposes. The European Digital Identity Wallet could help to solve the problems which are with excessive data processing, uh, as it would allow the data subject to actually reveal only those data that are strictly necessary to achieve the purpose. In other words, if this, uh, the purpose uh, is age verification, the user could choose to submit only his birth date, but uh, without uh, disclosing any other personal information, 
which are not relevant to this purpose. Or even more advanced, the implementation chosen uh, admits uh, the wallet would not transmit any information, but the fact that the app has verified the uh, required uh, information. If the purpose is identification, for example, in banking or telecommunication sector, uh, as it is required by law, the user could reveal only those pieces of identity data which are mandated by law and keep the other ones uh, out of the knowledge of the uh, other users. And uh, without biometric identifiers, uh, for example, uh, if the processing is not explicitly required. What I'm trying to say is that if we implement this uh, uh, idea right, if we implement the uh, uh, legal acts right, uh, um, the digital world can be even privacy friendlier than the solutions, the analog solutions that we have at the moment, the real life uh, transactions that we have at the moment. Provided that the possibilities which presents technology is offering uh, are used in the right way. And speaking of implementation, I have also taken note of the Commission recommendation on the common, use, uh, common Union Toolbox for the implementation of the European Digital Identity Framework, which includes the timeline uh, with the important milestones. In my view, the European Digital Identity Wallet has uh, a lot of opportunities, uh, and uh, uh, opportunities for the privacy and data protection as well. But such privacy-friendly functionalities do not automatically come with the notion of the digital identity and self-sovereignty, so we have to work on that. Functionalities that enhance privacy and data protection may also, or may not, be implemented in practice. So in this respect, I would have uh, been happier with the proposal that would have given me more insight into the, what to expect uh, from the implementation in the member states. I have to say that there is quite a lot of information which we will get only from the implementation, uh, uh, on the implementation phase from the Implementing Act uh, by the Commission. And that sets the problem of the delegation and sub-delegation when it goes to the legal norms that should be passed in the Parliament. The envisaged technical implementation will ultimately determine the whether the additional data protection safeguards should be integrated in the regulation and whether its design will be in accordance with the general data protection regulation. The technical architecture cannot be fully assessed until all these up to 28 Commission implementing acts are known, or at least we know what they will consist of and what kind of information we will be able to find there. Uh, I think that citizens can make full use of both public and private uh, online services seamlessly throughout the uh, EU with the help of the wallet. But uh, uh, this uh, exchange of the, of the identification uh, possibilities which we have right now from the platforms uh, creates some challenges to privacy as well, and that's the second part of my today's presentation. Well, the digital identity wallet will be based on decentralized scam, which consists of the European digital identity wallet issuing authorities, trust service providers, public and private service providers that rely on this uh, identity wallet. With four types of actors involved, it's important the, res the responsibilities uh, that come with each or all is attributed. And we would love to have it clearly defined by law what roles of actors are involved uh, as either controllers or joint controllers, uh, if they are either controllers or joint controllers to avoid uncertainties uh, in this uh, subject. There are cybersecurity uh, threats uh, which are present here, but I know that there are uh, very good cybersecurity specialists who are speaking after me, so I'm going to skip this uh, part of the presentation from us since we uh, somehow, uh, uh, some, somehow support uh, the uh, concerns, but at the same time seeing the opportunities. 
Third, the proposal contains provision regulating the behavior of the trust service provider and the issuing authorities uh, for the wallet, but it remains multitasked when it comes to the relying parties. And some may argue that the digital identity wallet may be the first step towards the end of anonymity in the Internet. And that's the thing which I would want all the uh, members of the European Parliament to remember about. Right now we are talking about the very interesting good solution for the services in Europe. But it can be misused as well. If we think about the mandatory identification of the users of Internet, which is somehow discussed in this House, then this identity wallet may be the missing puzzle to, to, to create something like that. Especially if we think about the unique identifier and the things connected with it. Article 6b of the proposal requires relying parties to communicate to the member states of their establishment their intent to rely on the digital identity wallet. Uh, when communicating this intention to rely on that, they shall also inform about the intended use of the digital identity wallet. And the member states could therefore check whether the requirement to identify at the specific purposes given uh, uh, are, uh, are met. And uh, the unique identifier, though it's not mandatory and there is no um, compulsory system for that uh, in, in Europe, uh, may also create some problems in those countries where existence of the unique identifier is either, uh, is either uh, forbidden by law or even is forbidden by the Constitution. Well, I come myself from the country where it is a load. We are in Belgium in the country where it's uh, also a load, but there are other countries with the other solutions. I believe that this regulation shall ensure also that the relying parties that are implementing the safeguards uh, and the member states uh, uh, will check uh, the, uh, uh, the required, uh, uh, required uh, uh, features. To further promote the compliance with the data protection principles, one could also further specify which categories of data can be re requested from the users of the wallet and uh, which we are depending uh, on. If we do not implement the data protection by default, uh, the digital experience will not differ from the analog one. A service provider asks for excessive data and the user is left with the decision to release the data or not to have the user's services. So identity wallet is a good idea, but the implementation will be probably even more important than the, uh, than the concept which is presented. To sum up, the European, uh, European uh, Digital Identity Wallet is the project which is not only designed to make digital services uh, possible or better or easier, but can also potentially be used uh, in order to have the better privacy protection. Whether it will realize this potential does not only depend on this regulation, but also very much on implementation. However, it will be my job, together with the national supervisory authorities, to make sure that the implementation will contain the necessary safeguards. And with this in mind, I invite the Commission to keep us informed about the development, of, especially of the Union Toolbox. And let me also thank all the people who worked so far on this project, especially the Commission, for, uh, for uh, consulting it with the European Data Protection Supervisor several times during the process, where, which allowed us uh, to already implement a lot of safeguards in the proposal that is given uh, to the Parliament uh, and uh, to the Council. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and of course I'm ready to answer all the questions. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, please uh, remember to stick to allocated time, and the next speaker now is uh, Mr. Alban Ferro, the President of Eurosmart, for seven minutes. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, dear Chair, dear Member of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really delighted to be here as president of Eurosmart. So Eurosmart is a truly European association which assembles European digital security industry. Within its various working groups, it gathers highly skilled technical experts. And since its creation, 
USMAT has been continuously advocating for high security in digital interactions. Regarding digital identity, this is a topic which is closely monitored by Eurosmart, which started first in 1999 with the Directive on Electronic Signature, which was the first step towards a pan-European digital identity. Regarding AIDAS, this is a major initiative for citizens, member states and industry. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to define a digital identity for more than 450 million European citizens. We shall not miss this opportunity. Instead, we shall make this ambition a reality, and even more, we shall make it a European success. This text shall shape a trustworthy and secure digital identity for ecosystem for all citizens. According to Smarts, there are three success factors that should be considered. Data protection, security, and open and transparent ecosystem. Regarding data protection, we very much welcome the provision of Article 6C2, which actually mandates a data protection certification for wallet. This is a very good step forward, even though the methodology is still to be defined. However, regarding electronic attestation provider, the issue is not the same. In Article 45F, there is no, not so the same level of requirement. Therefore, we recommend also to have a mandatory data protection certification for electronic attestation providers. Also, three topics should be clarified. First one is the territoriality of data. Data should be stored and processed exclusively on EU soil. Second point, the separate legal entity as enacted in Article 45F. The scope of activity that should be nested within such legal entity is to be clarified. Third point, still in Article 45F, the level of protection for data of legal entity, legal person, is not ensured, unlike the data pertaining to natural persons. This should be clearly considered by the Parliament, in particular in the light of the Cloud Act. Security. Security is also is a, the utmost important for citizens. Uh, at Eurosmart, we believe that a high level of security should be ensured for the wallet. And in order to ensure this level of security, the, it, it's important to set up the technical methodology and criteria to assess the security. Security should be assessed thanks to ethical hacking. You're relying on the expertise of highly skilled experts. Surprisingly, as security is expected from any of us, and obvious for any of us, it's not explicitly stated as a key feature the wallet should fulfill in Article 6A. We recommend the MEPs to consider adding this provision in Article 6A. Also, security is absolutely essential. Therefore, we recommend to have a mandatory security certification of the wallet. A mandatory security certification relying on the European Cybersecurity Certification Scheme pursuant to the Cyber Act. Also, as the issue is very sensitive, both for citizens and also for member states, the highest level of confidence is needed. Therefore, the level high should be targeted. Third point, open and transparent ecosystem. We all know that this infrastructure is likely to rely on the mobile phone that each and every citizen has in his pocket. Also, we know that this ecosystem is highly dependent on gatekeepers. On the other hand, if we want this digital identity ecosystem that is to be shaped to be a success, it's important to, show, to foster competition. Competition is virtuous to allow large development of digital identity, to allow emergence of new technologies, to, new, to allow emergence of new usages that will offer better inclusivity, better accessibility to each and every citizen, and ultimately, a large penetration. Competition is virtuous. Indeed, competition should be fair, competition should be controlled, but a good level of competition is needed because competition is a key factor to foster innovation. Therefore, DMA has a special role, a special role to play in that, in, in that domain. DMA will allow technology provider, will allow service provider to fully access key components on the mobile phone, be it hardware components, be it software components, or being operating system. For instance, thanks to DMA, it will be possible for technology provider to fully access the secure hardware in the mobile phone so that they could use it to store sensitive credential in there. Sensitive credential, for instance, could be personal data or authentication keys. Also, 
if they could rely on it to get free access to the biometric sensor on a mobile phone, which is very convenient to authenticate the holder. Therefore, the MA is really very important. The MA, the success of AI DAS, will largely depend on the success of the MA. AI DAS and the MA goes hand in hand. A few words of conclusion. Security and data protection are absolutely of the utmost importance. First, because they are the key, con key condition to create the confidence in the citizen eyes in this digital identity ecosystem that is going to be shaped. But also, it's of the utmost importance for the member states and Europe as at large. It will support sovereignty, first, by making sure that the data are controlled exclusively under European laws, be it from member states or being from the Commission, from the European. And also, the mandatory cybersecurity certification will help shape a very robust ecosystem. The cybersecurity certification scheme will allow review by the trusted third parties to make sure there is no flow, no backdoor in the ecosystem. And it's of the utmost importance because this infrastructure in the future will become critical. It will become critical to support the advent of the digital single market. Therefore, security certification also is key for sovereignty. With regard to the open and transparent ecosystem, it's also very important because a fair level of competition is important to foster innovation. Innovation will, will, will feed new use cases, new technology, better inclusivity, better accessibility for each and any citizen. Therefore, DMA is instrumental. If you want to know more about your smart views on digital identity, please feel free to get to our website where all the paper and position are published. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And the next speaker is Professor uh, Rannenberg, Chair of uh, Mobile Bus uh, Business and Material S Security Please, uh, for seven minutes. Okay. So thank you very much for your kind invitation and for the opportunity to uh, present a position. I have prepared a slide presentation that I suppose will be put on the screen in parallel to what I'm saying. And while this is being prepared, maybe let me already thank um, the previous speakers for lining out the really big opportunity that comes with this um, wallet proposal and with the identity management proposal. It's a great, um, a great opportunity for Europe in several dimensions. And at the same time, it's a great challenge and we need to and get it right. So there's a lot of work to be done and I think there's also a lot of work to be done um, for the Parliament. Um, just a quick question, do people see my slides? If not, can that be enabled uh, maybe because I wanted to interact with the slides a bit. We need, sorry, we need one minute. Okay, so if it doesn't count to by minutes, it's okay. But um, okay. the... So, but let me maybe maybe continue. So we have seen already the um, great opportunities that can come from the um, that can come from this identity management for the digital market. Also, uh, we've seen some of the advantages that can come to um, can come to data protection by giving more control um, to users. I think this is also and can also be a good exercise to strengthen European digital sovereignty and improve um, the security of identity management at all. In, in, all in all, maybe to show how European technology can be done uh, properly and how the European way to do technology can be done. I think that is an, a great opportunity, but it needs to be done thoroughly. That's really important. Um, I should maybe also mention um, that I've um, discussed with a number of parties and people to um, prepare the statement, even though it is a personal statement. But I'd like to mention CyberSec for Europe and the expert in that European project and the Council of European Professional Informatics and societies and a number of colleagues at Goethe University in Frankfurt and the I consulted papers from the European Credit Sector Association. So if you go to the next slide, that gives you the acknowledgements um, that I wanted to give, but again, the statement in itself is personal. So, okay, I think I mentioned those. I will let me, let me um, continue then maybe already now while the slides are hopefully coming up. Um, I think what is an important paradigm in this um, very important paradigm is in full control by users. That is a very important paradigm in the area of identity management. It has already been named by my 
predecessors, and it's, I think it's mentioned in Article 1 and Paragraph 7, and that is going to put up something in, in, in Article 6a then. Okay, so let's go maybe then from this slide to the next slide, please. Slide number two that shows you, gives you the acknowledgements as I've mentioned them. And that is again the great opportunity that I think we have now discussed and I'm happy to point out. So we can go to slide number four now. And that is where really I would need. So this was the great opportunity. I think we've discussed it now. Slide number four is the next slide. And that in discusses the full control by the user's paradigm. And it is a very important and very important paradigm. It's very good that it's in the in, in the regulation draft. And because only that will create the necessary trust that we have by users. Um, but the implementation is important. If you want to see learnings on that one, for example, ABC for Trust is a European project and, and that has and done several examples on this and exercises on this, and we've learned quite a lot of it. Let's do the following check now on the and say, and Wojciech uh, Wierowski said that example, can users really authenticate with a single attribute like over 18? Because that is something that happens in many applications. So let's see where this is going to work out in the implementation. So go to, if we go to the next slide, um, first thing is where we see, we have the feeling that maybe some homework is needed. And so what do we have in the respective definitions of the wallet? It says, provide a mechanism to, and to authenticate the user. That is what is in the new part. In the existing part of the regulation, it says authentication enables electronic identification of a natural or legal person. The question is, does that mean that over 18 is good enough to get me access or is something more meant in terms of identification here? Um, there is some other text, of course, beside in, in the definition of authentication, but I think that needs to be checked and clarified, especially for the unlinkability aspects that already also and the and EDP, EDPS has already mentioned. So let's go to the next slides. This was a little bit of legal legal homework that maybe we need to do. You know, you're dealing with a professor who's giving homework. Now, the big question is, where is the wallet? And obviously, because of the and technological neutrality paradigm, there is no explicit decision on the technology in the in regulation, but there is a strong impression that you can get when you read the materials and in the text and also in the in text beside it. And one has this feeling that the wallet is basically some storage space provided by providers, cloud providers maybe, or by ledgers, and it's accessed by users via a smartphone app. Maybe something is also in the smartphone app. App-based wallets is a text part that you actually find in, in one of the sections of the documents. So how much control do users have in those, these scenarios? Let's go to the next slide and have a look on what kind of controls we can expect for users and what do we see. So cloud providers. Um, there may be a contract-based customer relationship. But does it mean full control by the user? It definitely will need protection, would need protection by the and regulator. And of course, it's only as good as the cloud provider. European soil was mentioned already by Mr. Ferro, is actually following things. But again, that is a thing that need to we look at. Ledgers are decentralized, that can be helpful. But how do you get an attribute out of a ledger that is not visible any um, anymore or viable anymore. So you have an old attribute and you don't want to get that, um, you don't want people to see that anymore. Um, with a ledger, that is, an, is a challenge. So what we need to do in server checking, and I think it was mentioned already, probably not only of this regulation, but of the implementing acts, is what are the control options for users? What are the security properties? And how does really decentralized storage, decentralized storage in user devices work? And that gets us to the next slide, um, because now we look at the user design side of the definition. So obviously, smart devices are being discussed, especially smartphones. And what is the scenario that we have with smartphones nowadays? They have a rich functionality. Almost everything can happen on a smartphone. They have many, many interfaces, mobile network always, but also wireless, LAN, NFC, everything. Some people call them interface monsters. They have a very high complexity, and we have a dependency on two main operating system providers at the moment. All of that and has inherent challenges for security. For example, the paradigm, what you see is what you sign, and that we know from digital signature discussions, is a paradigm that is endangered by this. And it's also inherent challenges for control by users. So we need to keep, in, keep this in mind. And certification was mentioned, and but more is maybe even needed. Architecture discussion is maybe needed. 
Um, and there is competing legislation on the horizon, I'm afraid. You may have heard about the legislation to effectively tackle child sexual abuse online that is somewhere in the willings. Maybe it is published a draft on March 2, 2022. If we go to the next slide, um, we don't know much about this legislation, but a few things have, have leaked through and they have effects on the smartphone. Um, if it's published in March 2022, we have to see. But anyway, um, related experts have been discussed. Restriction on encryption. And sometimes restriction on encryption on the device. And that can severely limit the trustworthy protection of identity information between the cloud and the device. So if we have one regulation that tries to build up encryption and, and cryptology with proper security, and we have the other one, that's a challenge. Client-side scanning on all user devices has also been discussed to detect and, and possibly inappropriate content or something like that. That can be severely impact the integrity of scanned client devices, typically smartphones that are used in social networks. And I think it's very important, as if for you as a parliament, to make sure that the competing legislation doesn't destroy the foundations on which the wallet and the trustworthy infrastructure are being built. You're building a house, we're building a house. At the same time, we must be sure that the fundament foundation of it isn't isn't destroyed. Um, page number 10, please, the next slide, um, gets us back to platform options. So obviously, current popular smartphones with apps you find on the bottom, established convenience, but with limited security, even in the current scenario. Um, on the other side, on the top, you find smart cards and dedicated smart card readers or access devices based on them. That is coming from the school of the digital signature. And we know they can be, have better security because they have limited complexity. They have potentially limited convenience. Many examples and trials that we have done, people found this inconvenient. And of course, smartphones are much more sexy and much more convenient. However, um, they are less secure. So this is a challenge. There are examples for enhanced smartphones, sometimes additional hardware like secure elements or so that needs to be explored, but one needs to really see how, how much can they protect. There are improved system and encryption software approaches like split key encryption. They also need to be assessed. It was mentioned again, it needs to be evaluated what can be done, but I think this also needs to be evaluated to some degree, um, to some degree including implementing acts before we can say we have a real good infrastructure here. And if we build a migration pass, we need to be careful about it. Gets me to slide number 11. And that is transparency is important. I think it was mentioned before, but in this case, because this is actually an infrastructure, we're building a core infrastructure for the European Information Society. And this is, I think transparency, both for the technology is important, is also important for every decisions that are being made. Maybe there are competing requirements. You have aligned out a few examples. I think it's absolutely important that the decisions are being made with regard to these competing requirements are made in maximum transparency. And I think that involves also you as a Parliament. Sorry, I'm giving you homework. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and the other thing is open source solutions may be helpful here. They should be they should be checked. They need to be considered. They also need to be budgeted for because many people have made investments and many companies have made investments. And of course, and we cannot simply take away everything that they have um, just for transparency. And, and we cannot ask for that for being free. So it needs to be budgeted, which gets me to slide number 12. From transparency, we go to economic and issues and challenges. Um, very often, a protected ICT and security is not honored by the market because often free options are convenient, even though they're insecure. It's not always a level playing field here. It needs support. We see that in many, many other areas. I'm sure experts can, other experts can give more examples. So now what I'm looking at is, I see market domination. It was mentioned already with software operating systems, or smartphone operating systems, hardware, we can have a market domination scenario. Um, let's have a look at the resources. I see 30 million one euro as investment. That looks very limited to me for this endeavor. I think we need to put more into this. I see six to 12 months uh, several times for commission finishing up requirements and for member states coming up with something. That looks to me like much too hurried. It's an important thing. We should start now and, and we should not be slow, but we, I think, need to plan more time for this. Um, gets me to the next slide. And that would be 
this is what can happen when you have pressure on time pressure, and it tells you a bit of ambiguity on German, on standing if you if you know German. Um, if you look at it, and this is a publication of a German ministry under a German minister, and you, if you look at the date, twenty uh, third of September of two thousand twenty one. That was three days before the big federal elections, and for, for the federal parliament in Germany, and last year. And this was a minister presenting a wonderful new solution just three days before the election. Um, next slide, please. So you will see the same picture, but now with a newspaper report, and you look at the date 1st of October. Eight days later, it turned out that this infrastructure was not standing to be to be working, but it was standing still or needed to be put standing still because lots of mistakes in it and issues in it, and that basically came out after a few days. And I'm pretty sure that um, Germany can do better than this example. I know that Germany can do better than this example. When I'm bringing this here as an example for what can happen with time pressure, when time pressure comes in, and, and then you can have these kind of solutions. By the way, what you see in the picture was the idea to have a driving license being digitalized. That's popular with Germans, of course. Um, and again, but that, is, that shows you what happens when time pressure comes into the, into the game. Next slide, please. Mm. So these are further specific aspects. I probably am um, a bit over my time, so I'm not only going to maybe mention uh, one aspect here also that is the people who investigated and in, who invested into an assuring authentication and banking sector people, for example, based on PSD2. Um, they have invested. We need to see, make sure that they're not fully in, in frustrated for the investment. So we need to find a proper um, migration, integration, and synchronization with what is happening in the PSD2 banking world here. And next slide, please. And that is a summary and recommendations. Mm. So this is important. This is essential. It can be a showcase how to do things right. And I really look forward to that. And I'm happy that I was, was asked to give this comments. Um, we need to be aware that we need to gain and preserve user trust. That's absolutely core for this. Um, we have technological challenges and we have conflicting requirements. If it was easy, we, it wouldn't be us doing it. But and that is something we need to keep in mind. We need to involve all communities. The German example that I show you, or this German rushed example, is a good example on how not to do things. It's important to involve all communities, which didn't really happen, involve independent experts, involve civil society, make sure that also the resident experts are actually listened to, um, and make decisions with utmost transparency and not in a rushed fashion, and reserve sufficient resources, time I mentioned, and also money. With that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to any kind of comments and questions. Um, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are also under pressure of time, and uh, now we have a de delay. Um, next speaker is uh, Thomas uh, Loninger, Executive Director of Digital Rights NGO. Seven minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have been given the permission to, to speak and I hope I'm on. I also have a presentation. And let me use the time before that uh, is up to also um, very much thank you for this invitation. Um, I am very honored to speak and it's a delight um, to, to address the um, parliamentarians. Um, and yeah, um, I am speaking here on behalf of um, uh, Epicenter Works, which is an Austrian digital rights organization, but I'm also mandated to speak on behalf of European Digital Rights, which is an umbrella organization of 45 privacy and digital rights NGOs um, in almost all European countries. Um, and I'm trying to also bring you now the civil society um, perspective and so also the user perspective on this very important file. Um, the presentation is still not up, but I would like to stress what my previous, uh, what the previous speakers have already said. This is this is an extremely important file. 
uh, go to slide number two, please. Um, because it is uh, not just, um, for me, a general purpose infrastructure. Um, it is also something that could be an important architecture um, for the identification and authentication of users and also to verify attributes about them, not just towards governments, but also towards the private sector. Um, and I think the Commission has made sure with several provisions that um, this will become a very widespread technology that uh, we will see in almost all aspects of our daily lives. Uh, and this is also why it is so important that the European Parliament includes the safeguards that are currently missing in the Commission proposal. And that brings me to slide number three. Um, right now, we have a huge problem in Article 11a, uh, which mandates um, a unique uh, persistent identifier. Uh, such an ID would be unlawful and unconstitutional in several countries and would, of course, offer many ways of uh, limiting anonymity, of tracking users. Um, and although it is only required for situation in which uh, identification is legally mandated, that, of course, then raises the question how free and, and consent can be given to share this information. Um, and we'll revisit the option of not using the wallet app uh, in, the, in the final section of my presentation. Um, I will um, briefly touch next slide uh, on the fact that selective disclosures are in the proposal, which would be a very important privacy-preserving technology element, um, which is also minimizing the data impact and so would be really something that would be fitting for a European solution to this problem. But sadly, as the previous speaker has explained, um, there are legal hurdles in Article 6A4D in combination with 3.5, which need to be addressed because right now um, the uncertainty that we see throughout the proposal um, is also um, uh, destroying the privacy benefit that such technology elements hopefully will bring. Um, and I will not address the 28 implementing and delegated acts that have uh, already been mentioned in the beginning. And I think uh, it is up to the House to also um, uh, include a concreteness in this proposal so that not all decisions are kicked further down the road. Um, the problem is really that some of these delegated acts are um, including very important procedural safeguards and architectural principles. Uh, and the full risk assessment of the proposal as it stands is almost impossible without knowing the details that will only be decided by the implementing action that could also change after the proposal was adopted. Um, going to slide number six, please. Um, this is also uh, now, next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is a panopticon, which is uh, a little bit the worry that um, we in the privacy community have with this proposal, uh, because, next slide, uh, in Article 6a, you can see that there um, is a clear logical and physical separation of the data that the wallet provider will uh, obtain on the use of the wallet. But at the same time, there are also acknowledgements uh, that this data um, will be available to the provider of the wallet, uh, which uh, we believe is really uh, unnecessary. There would be technical standards uh, in the SSI world where self-sovereign identities uh, that are based on zero knowledge, um, some even without ledgers. So there would be technical standards that would guarantee unobservability. Keep in mind that this is a general purpose infrastructure that will be used um, in many instances where we interact with our governments and with private corporations, online and offline. Uh, even the possibility of retaining information on all of these interactions and transactions is a huge pile of data. And um, we can really avoid this whole problem by choosing an infrastructure that does not allow for a central observation. Right now, the text is not good enough. Right now, this is still a danger. And speaking of trust and putting the user in control, I seriously believe that this is an important step that the Parliament has to take with AIDAS. Next slide, please. And at this point, I also want to uh, remind you of the EU COVID-19 digital certificate that was uh, passed by uh, the European Parliament last year. And although this was a file under urgency procedure um, at a time when the uh, COVID-19 health emergency was more severe than it maybe it's now, but still um, the Parliament could agree and could enshrine more safeguards when it comes to the unobservability of the system.
Um, so we do have, um, we previously had a very vague commission proposal um, with many delegated acts. And at the end, we had uh, very strong safeguards in the regulation itself um, that the European Parliament has fought for. And that's why there was so much applause from the privacy community uh, towards this proposal. Uh, and additionally, of course, uh, there were also clear rules when it comes to what a verifier can do uh, when, when they interact with the system, which is another important element that is missing. Um, and that brings me to the next slide. Um, because uh, a characteristic of the EDAS reform in front of us is that it is opening up towards private, uh, the private sector and relying parties are introduced and almost no safeguards are given towards this um, completely open-ended uh, way how uh, companies could interact with the wallet app. Um, we have no clear safeguards against the abuse of this system. Uh, we do know that there are already uh, companies in the media sector that would be willing to use this for um, administrating subscriptions and also using it for targeted advertisement. Um, and next slide, please. We have to acknowledge in this uh, instance that we do have uh, a lack of GDPR enforcement, sadly. Um, there are pay or consent schemes uh, on many newspapers in Europe. We have um, a prohibition of tying in the GDPR that is almost not enforced. And uh, we would really like to see uh, proper safeguards for the relying parties that would also check their use cases um, and also potentially have a blacklist of certain use cases that we do not want this system to be used for. And there needs to be a mechanism to also revoke the access of a relying party to the system. Right now, just giving a carte blanche in the beginning when someone says, I want to use that uh, with a country of origin principle that will lead to Ireland basically uh, not enforcing this at all, uh, that becomes a huge problem for, for us further down the road. Next slide, please. Um, because that is um, creating the danger of uh, identity information proliferating towards uh, the advertisement industry. And to put it in a nutshell, Google already knows a lot about all of us. But one thing that they currently know in very few instances is our legal name. This proposal should not lead to a situation where Europe is handing them that. Um, next slide. Uh, and I'm looking for the time. Uh, one thing that we really have to mention here is the problem that is created uh, for web browsers in Article 45, the introduction of qualified web authentication certificates um, and putting them basically on the same uh, level as the root CAs. Uh, that is really uh, attacking the web security. And there is legitimate concern from the browser community, from ISOC and from many uh, aspects of civil society. Uh, so please don't break the web by uh, doing AIDAS. So I hope that we can find a better solution uh, for this. Um, next slide. Uh, cybersecurity challenges were already mentioned, and I want to focus on uh, the digital divide here because particularly low-income households um, and low-educational households will face challenges with um, obtaining a smartphone in the first place, obtaining a smartphone that still receives security updates from the vendors, and then having the digital literacy to also apply these in practice. If we make mistakes here, we will invite the most vulnerable uh, parts of our society for massive identity theft. Uh, any smartphone-based system has this pitfall. Right now, this is not addressed at all in the proposal. And I think those things have uh, to be tackled and cannot be hidden uh, behind technological neutrality. Um, next slide, please. Um, the digital divide in general will become a problem. Um, right now, the proposal contains language of saying the user is con in control. We hear something similar from Commissioner Vestager in Breton. But the reality is that uh, if citizens and residents decide not to use that system, they will face um, uh, disadvantages. In my own home country, in Austria, it is already the case if a citizen is not using the electronic identity system for interacting with the government, you very often pay more for government services, sometimes up to 30 or 40 percent. 
Uh, so uh, there is not really a choice, particularly for low income households, not to use the system. And that, of course, ties back into the security concerns. And one solution that we would like to see here is an anti-discrimination provision to at least have in the realm of uh, government services a legitimate option for citizens not to use the system without being disadvantaged. Um, and final, next slide, please. Uh, ultimately, this proposal has to be assessed on the impact it will have on the digital ecosystem that we have today. And uh, right now, with uh, the proposal as it stands, I'm not sure that uh, this will be a total sum benefit for privacy. Um, the, the consequences on anonymity uh, were already mentioned. And I really hope that we um, create an alternative that is up to European rights and values that really uh, um, we can be proudly also showing to the rest of the world as our solution for this big problem of identity and attribute attestation. And I also hope that we do not end up strengthening the tracking industry that, of course, will right now uh, find ways to interact with the system in a way that is clearly not intended. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It is uh, very important and complicated matter, so I didn't want to in interrupt you. Uh, but uh, just remember um, that uh, we have uh, also limited time. Uh, the last speaker as an expert is Katalina Dodo from <coughs> Romania's Employers Association of Software and Services Industry. Uh, please, for seven minutes. Is Madame Dodd? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hello. Hello, Mr. Chair. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's an important uh, project that we are talking today, and it's a, it's a big aim and ambitious uh, plan that we have in front of us. I do have some slides. Uh, uh, I can talk as they are prepared, and uh, we'll, we'll see when uh, they will be ready. Uh, so, um, we are today uh, in, uh, uh, in, f in the middle of a big uh, digital transformation. This is something that we all know we are all facing already and uh, that it's uh, bringing uh, all the time the, the trust uh, that, uh, that uh, needs to be in the middle and that n needs to be at the base. Therefore, uh, what uh, I do see as an important part of this uh, uh, these actions is uh, to, to simplify the trust and to provide user-friendly solutions uh, for, uh, for the citizens and for the businesses uh, that can, uh, can rely on it. Uh, and of course, a very important uh, element of this uh, approach should be to, to provide control to the users on how to use uh, their personal data and how much to share and to be, to be protected from this perspective. Therefore, I do believe digital, European digital water, uh, wallet is a step in the right direction. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we need to, to accelerate uh, the EU-wide usage of uh, secure and user-friendly digital identities. And I'll explain further on what, uh, what I do, do have uh, in mind behind, uh, behind this and how to use it. Uh, so, uh, of course, and it was mentioned by, uh, by previous uh, um, uh, colleagues, if we can move to, to the third uh, slide, please. Um, it was mentioned security, and um, as you've seen in uh, in the introduction slide, I'm uh, uh, I'm personally working in uh, the security environment for since more than 20 years, and uh, this is something that we are always we see and that we see essential for uh, for this project too. Uh, we need that uh, this uh, European digital wallet. It's based on high security and certification to protect uh, uh, personal data of European citizens, and this is mandatory and is critical as it was mentioned already. Uh, it was 
mentioned the privacy. So we need to uh, to work on the private use cases and uh, to ensure uh, that uh, adoption and uh, use of uh, digital identity must be focused on establishing a meaningful and uh, cross-border use cases. So. Uh, this is important to to protect the citizen to to have all the mechanisms and uh, uh, tools in place to to protect the system itself um, it was mentioned the control that citizen is to have and the, the trust that they need to that we need to build in uh, in this uh, in this system next slide please uh, so one important matter that i wanted to bring today is inclusion for all eu citizens uh, of course and uh, this uh, this project is coming with a lot of advantages. There are some challenges that I'm pretty sure, I'm very sure that we can overcome as Europe. We are a force. We have the competencies here. We have the people. We have experience in different areas. So I'm sure that all together we can come to a good system. It's important that this, this system is accessible to all our citizens. And I'm considering here uh, the fact that we still do have countries where there is no electronic ID. Uh, in place and uh, those people in some countries we have challenges in terms of legislation or decisions in terms of legislation but we have countries that are simply behind uh, as they cannot uh, implement by themselves uh, alone uh, such complex systems therefore i do see an important matter to to be sure that it this system is coming not only with some recommendations on what to do but really that is coming with clear uh, help in terms of legal, technical specification or even architectures on how to implement such a system. And uh, um, recommended tools or uh, minimum requirements that needs to be put it in place as the, implement, the countries implementing the system uh, could uh, move fast and of course uh, spend uh, less money in analyzing and in trying to understand such a complex system. It's not easy to do alone, especially if the, we are talking about countries that are uh, behind. Therefore, we I do see uh, a clear need in uh, supporting with uh, more than only recommendation uh, implementation uh, of uh, such a system in the countries. Um, and of course, it's important that uh, the way the system will be consumed by uh, by the people will be uh, simple in a natural manner and uh, talking about mobile devices that are now with almost everybody. But of course, considering how uh, data will be protected at the level of the system, but also the le level of the device. Um, and again, I'm coming to, to cybersecurity uh, from where I belong more. <laughs> it's uh, that uh, we need to, to protect uh, with the system uh, data of, uh, of our citizens. Um, one uh, important aspect is also to, to be sure that uh, the usage of European Digital Identity Wallet is uh, uh, accepted without any other uh, decision by public and some private uh, entities, especially by the public. So sh we shall ensure uh, that uh, in the countries, uh, that uh, in European countries, this is accepted by uh, at least by all public uh, institution without other decisions. And again, I have in mind uh, countries that are uh, behind and where implementation of a digital identity is late, but also even the simple Sign electronic signature is a challenge to be accepted by some public institutions. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, of course, it's a it's a complex project. Um, it's good we have it. It's great we have it. Uh, but uh, if we want to move fast, and I think we have to move fast, it's important that we bring together the experience of the private sector. Uh, together with uh, with uh, all institutions building this uh, this project, uh, that we use the the experience, the brain that we have uh, in Europe, uh, the level of citizens or the level or concentrated at the level of companies, uh, that uh, together we do invest uh, in Europe in a value chain and technological innovation uh, system that can support such development, which is ambitious. And of course, uh, if we want to have it fast, we need to, to bring together 
all the uh, expertise that we have already is just to bring it at the right table. Thank you very much for having me here and I'm ready for questions. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now we go to the first uh, round of our discussion. And the first speaker is Romana Jerkovic, uh, rapporteur for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me the floor. It's so, it's so good to uh, have all these distinguished uh, panelists with us today. It was interesting to uh, hear their views uh, and suggestions how we can improve uh, the Commission's uh, proposal. Europe has gone uh, a long way in building a, a leading digital identity ecosystem, but more needs to be done. We should um, accelerate the pace of the progress and we should be able to respond to technological changes uh, and uh, new market uh, realities, but also to user demands and uh, their expectations. 60% of uh, the users want a secure uh, single digital ID for all online services that gives them uh, control over the use of their data, while 72% of users want to know how their data uh, is used when they use social media. And we also have strong demand uh, in the private sector for these uh, services. Um, there are many open issues which we uh, need to uh, address, such as um, uh, architecture of certification, implementing acts, uh, terminology, cross-border usage, the use of the unique and personal identifier. Um, I am in a full agreement with Mr. Uh, Ferro and uh, Ms. Dodu um, that the digital wallet needs to be at the highest level of security and that the certification needs uh, to be mandatory. And um, I also agree with Mr. Jarowski that the digital wallet uh, has the potential to tackle um, the issue of the excessive processing of the personal data. Um, certainly protection of personal data must be very high on our uh, agenda. Um, Mr. Uh, Rannenberg um, spoke of the importance of trust, uh, uh, transparency and uh, giving the users more control over management of personal data. Um, to ensure broad pick up of digital identity systems, gaining citizens' trust uh, and ensuring uh, a mutual recognition will be uh, essential. And as uh, was mentioned by the panelists, uh, there is a whole range of legislative acts, um, digital service and digital uh, market act, cyber security act, the upcoming data uh, act, which are currently being negotiated uh, that uh, uh, we will need to carefully consider in order to ensure legislative uh, coherence, uh, to avoid overlaps and to minimize risk of possible exemptions uh, uh, for the big uh, platforms. Do we have sufficient um, safeguards which will guarantee a harmonized level of trust in the EU? That's very important. Um, anyway, uh, all these uh, challenges should not prevent us uh, from being uh, ambitious and uh, bold in our vision. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. The next speaker is Pascal Arimo from EPP. Two minutes. Yeah, vielen Dank, Sie, Herr thank you, Chair. I would, on behalf of my dear colleagues, Leo Terras, who's shadow rapporteur on this. I'm myself a rapporteur on you, in Yuri on this. I'd like to thank, on behalf of him and on behalf of myself, thank all the experts for their interesting presentations on this commission proposal, which is very technical, and for people not from this sphere, quite difficult to understand, to follow. We all understand the importance of what's being built up here, constructed, but we need to look in detail to make sure that we have a text ultimately, which can, is improved at the end of the day. My questions fundamentally are to do with all three experts. First question has to do with the introduction of wallets and has to do with the question whether wallets are pu should be public goods. 
which the state can demand or should the state also issue should be should the state be an issuer of the wallet second question has to do with cross-border interoperability of EID data I think when we look at this in the European context and want to define it interoperability and cross-border interoperability is more and more important otherwise European legislation doesn't make much sense and how will it be possible for the EID data within a Belgian wallet for example to be transferred to a German wallet say for many people in cross-border areas of which there are many in Europe that is absolutely critical when we're looking at accepting such a wallet or not and third question about security of attributes how can false attributes be avoided other way in other words how can I ensure that I am truly I truly have this attribute to pr prevent for example if you take the vaccine pass that I can take another person's vaccine pass can use that even though I myself might not be vaccinated how can in technical and legal terms how can we be in ensured that abuse not does not occur and how can we ensure that use with the EID is connected with EID or parts of it for example uh, age limits those are my three questions and I thank the experts in advance for their responses next because I mituta tomin serino Thank you, thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, thank you to all the speakers for uh, for their valuable uh, input. Um, in my view, um, of course, if regulated correctly, um, I think EID uh, it's indeed a major opportunity for um, uh, all EU citizens uh, and businesses to benefit uh, from a secure uh, uh, digital identity. Um, I think. Um, it can allow them to access uh, services easily with uh, while remaining uh, in full control of their data. Um, my question addressed to all the speakers is uh, how do you assess and see the role of stakeholders and the private sector, um, let's say, in uh, bridging the gap uh, between the member states in the development and the rollout of the wallets, and what should be the, uh, the correct, uh, let's say, balance between the uh, the EU framework uh, on one side and the specific infrastructure uh, developed at national levels in order to uh, ensure a high degree of uh, harmonization uh, and uh, interoperability. Uh, I would also be interested to hear uh, your position on uh, website on authentication. Uh, what measures should we take in order to, uh, let's say, have a more inclusive uh, website authentication procedure for the IT community. I'm referring here to, uh, of course, IT experts, browsers and users, and how we can ensure that the browser community uh, complies with the new uh, requirements uh, on the recognition of uh, qualified certificates uh, for website uh, authentication. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Mikula Spexa from the Greens. Two minutes. Okay, does it work? Yes, we can see you, please. Ah. Okay, does it work now? I'm a bit surprised about the, the whole procedure, but hopefully it works. So uh, I, I will try to be short. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, very uh, nice presentations. I'm, uh, I was really uh, happy to, to learn more uh, from that. I would have a simple question maybe for all the speakers. Uh, should you have simply, uh, simply uh, propose uh, uh, one single measure to uh, actually uh, increase individual level of uh, security and privacy. Uh, what should uh, what should that be in order to improve the existing proposal as it, as it stays now? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Ma uh, Miss Melbach from ECR. Two minutes.
Yeah. Uh, good morning, good morning, uh, colleagues, experts. Uh, thank you for organizing uh, this event today. Um, uh, to use uh, the limited time productively, uh, let me go straight to the questions. Uh, one concerns the interplay between the public and private uh, sector. The Commission has been um, uh, uh, rather blunt that uh, uh, with the European Digital Identity Wallet, uh, it uh, um, uh, wants to preempt the tech sector in the race for sensitive private data. At the same time, if we look at the current uh, EID uh, AS and the use of identification and authentication solutions uh, developed by the private sector that uh, use our private data are already successfully used in some member states uh, to uh, access private and public services. Uh, put differently, if uh, the aim is to uh, never hand over sensitive data to private companies, the train uh, in some parts of the EU is already missed. Um, with uh, this in mind, do you believe there is a fundamental difference between a small uh, regional private company or, say, uh, the likes of Apple in uh, terms of ensuring uh, trust and uh, security. And uh, with the proposed approach, uh, do we not risk uh, to put a stop or even uh, reverse the technological innovation and uh, relevant solutions when it comes to authentication online? Uh, how do you see we can successfully bring the private sector on board as opposed to alienating it. And uh, furthermore, as uh, has been pointed out, governments too, uh, through the digital wallet, may end up uh, having more information on our day-to-day -day actions. For uh, many uh, constituents concerned with um, uh, personal liberties, it may seem that they rather share their data with private companies, not uh, the government. What is your view as to how uh, this can be reconciled? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Andrus Ansip, uh, IMCO reporter. One minute. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, speakers. Uh, my question would be about uh, the principle of uh, technological uh, neutrality and uh, the role of uh, software-based security. Software-based security uh, that doesn't rely on a specific hardware enables significantly shorter su supply chain as well as a stronger digital sovereignty. It also enables more flexible mitigation of uh, any security risk uh, uh, since uh, there is uh, no need uh, to replace uh, some physical components like chips, SIM cards uh, and secure elements. There are already such uh, secure software-based uh, threshold cryptography uh, technologies available and certified for digital identity services such as uh, split key uh, in the Baltics. My question to Mr. Ferro and uh, uh, Professor Ronneberg is, uh, do you also think uh, that software-based solutions must be equally promoted alongside with hardware solutions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Christian Ter has one minute as a Liebe rapporteur. Mr. Ter, Mr. please Ter press the speak button. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, Sorry. please. There are four points that I want to address in regards to this file, points that were raised during our uh, shadow meetings and discussions with different uh, interested parties. Some of them were even were, were uh, among the experts that spoke today, and others are uh, pretty much the, all the uh, web browsing community. So the first issue is in regards to the EID uh, system in itself. We currently have states like Germany, uh, Portugal, or Netherlands that are that 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 ruled. For example, the constitutional court ruled that uh, such an ID is unconstitutional 
according to their national constitution. So how exactly a system like this can be implemented all across Europe when we have already countries that, uh, you know, whose their constitutional courts rule that uh, such a unique ID or identifier per person, it's uh, unconstitutional. The second issue is in regards to the criminal cases. Currently, in order to get any evidence in regards to any crime, uh, we need uh, a decision from a judge. So how exactly will this work in case there will be uh, criminal cases uh, in front of national law enforcement agencies? Uh, who exactly will be will be granting rights to law enforcement agencies to uh, get any details in regards to this. Uh, the third issue is in regards to the security certificates. Uh, all the browsing companies, and I'm talking about Google, Apple, Mozilla, and Microsoft, raise serious concerns about the proposal from the Commission in regards to the uh, the security of the of the connection, and all of them agreed that there's not only a risk of uh, national states, for example, surveilling the traffic, but also uh, hostile and foreign governments to surveil the traffic of the EU citizens, which is, which is uh, raising serious concerns. And I'm wondering what the experts will have to say in regards to this. And the fourth point is the toolbox, which is totally non-transparent non, non right now. So it's hard to talk about any kind of legislation when we have lack of transparency in regards to this toolbox. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, please stick to allocated time. And now I give the floor to experts for very short answers, and then we have a second uh, round of discussion. Uh, please. So we start with uh, Mr. Wiewiórski, and then uh, um, Mr. Alban, please press the speak button. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So I'll try to, I will try to be short because there is numerous questions. So with regards to wallet being a, a public uh, good, um, Within the current text, actually, it's up to each member state to decide the governance models they, they want to set up, either issued by themselves, either uh, mandated to a third party under the supervision, either recognized. So I think this is in the remit of the member state to decide how to, to manage it. Uh, with regards to this interesting question regarding the security of attributes, uh, I think this question is very, very relevant. It's very important when issuing a decision of attribute to make sure that the attribute he is well bound to the, the holder. And here I think we have specific issues with regard to the governance of the trust services which are in charge of issuing electronic attestation of attributes. It means we must have a, a, a clear, te clear technical requirement that should be fulfilled first. Secondly, there should be a clear uh, certification uh, scheme. And this certification scheme should be under supervision of member states only. It should be controlled by EU member states. Uh, and this is key actually to ensure that all the procedures that are put in, put, put in force, that are enforced, are the same in each and any countries, which makes sure that which means that actually we must have a clear technical standards, which might uh, still to be to be prepared according to me. But this is a very relevant point. In particular, it's instrumental to be very precise first on identity proofing, and secondly on assessing the quality of the attribute used to generate the attestation. And this deserves very very a lot, a lot of scrutiny. Uh, regard, I go to the question from Mr. Anzip. I think um, regarding uh, I think technical neutrality uh, software solution versus hardware solution so uh, I think 
from the industry perspective that indeed the tech should be technology neutral. This is the best way to ensure technical innovation uh, in the future. But at the same time, it's very important that the legislator and the commission express in an objective manner the target and level of security to be met. And this should be expressed. And in here, actually, the importance of security certification scheme pursuant to the Cyber Act are very important. Therefore, uh, an obligation of security certification of wallet should be enacted so that actually each technology afterwards could be used uh, regardless of the, um, the implementation, provided they meet those security objectives. Also, I would like to pinpoint that if we look at the um, Cyber Secu Security Act, there is no mandate as of today for a security certification scheme for secure software. We have two that are currently been uh, launched by the Commission, once for transformation of Sogaes common criteria, another one for 5G, uh, uh, sorry, cloud, and 5G is the third one ongoing, but definitely if we want to properly address the wallet, we must have a mandate to have a, a pan-European security certification scheme for secure softwares. Also, uh, site technology should also be considered, uh, maybe a biometric authentication for on mobile phone, for just to name a few, but uh, I strongly support, uh, support this proposal. The tech should be technology neutral to software innovation, to foster innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that would be my, my main, uh, main answers. Thank, thank you very much. The expert has three minutes to answer. If uh, Mr. Wiewiórski would like to react to the discussion, then please, three minutes. Uh, thank you very much. That's, uh, um, I was already ready before, but uh, the, the, the uh, flow was transmitted to somebody else. But that's, uh, an, anyway, uh, my, my few suggestions uh, uh, after these questions. So there was a question from, uh, the, uh, from the member of the European Parliament on what would be the, best, the most important improvements uh, that we would like to uh, have and uh, first the European the, the digital uh, identity framework uh, as a very complex technical and organizational uh, architecture uh, needs the sufficient uh, definition of the responsibilities of involved parties. That would be the most important part uh, that I would advocate for. But I would also advocate for an answering the question about the uh, um, unique uh, and persistent electronic identifier in uh, being implemented in the countries where it might be a co uh, against the, the currently existing law, because even if, which I fully admit, uh, this is not mandatory system, and uh, that does not mean that everybody in these countries will get such an identifier by, by a default. Uh, it still means that the use of the electronic services uh, on, uh, with, with uh, ID will require such a solution. That, uh, if this is the, con uh, uh, if this is the uh, step towards the interoperable services uh, which should uh, promote the idea of uh, being uh, um, uh, being uh, identified uh, around Europe, that might be the questionable uh, questionable solution. And uh, uh, let me also address uh, the problem of the technical neutrality. I, f on one hand, uh, fully agree with the uh, fact that the software solutions uh, may uh, be at least as uh, um, uh, as uh, uh, secure as the hardware ones, uh, but uh, we decided not to assess uh, any of the solutions which already exist in the member states. That's where they are not in the uh, formal and informal comments of the European Data Protection Supervisor. But indeed, uh, the, uh, the, the decisions on what is allowed should be uh, issued according to the certification schemes, uh, both for the security, uh, but also for the, data, uh, for the uh, personal data protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now, now Professor um, Rannenberg, also three minutes, please. Thank you very much. So let me start maybe with a question from Mr. Amand on whether this should be in public good or a private good. And 
I think from the perspective of the user, it is important that there is a public good state provided service that is, let's say, offering a certain degree of minimum minimum service that is available where we can be sure that everybody can afford that. We have seen that with other telecommunications and postal services. Uh, let's say reasonable quality services for an affordable price is in, in, in some market scenarios a challenge. At the same time, I would say there should be the possibility and for and private operators to also offer something and to offer something and in parallel to this. This may then be an, an expensive exercise. We see that sometimes in media, with public broadcasting and private broadcasting in parallel. But I think this kind of parallelism, this kind of redundancy, as you may call it, is actually important in this phase of an infrastructure. And maybe sometime in future, we can rely on the market. But at the moment, I would say we couldn't. At the same time, I think we need the multiple. And we do need the multiple approaches here. And you were asking about the uh, securing of, of attributes, I think um, Mr. Anor has already uh, an answered that one. It is possible, it can be done, and but it needs refined analysis of some of the protocols that we haven't even um, haven't even seen yet. Um, I was specifically then asked for the uh, software solutions versus the hardware solutions. I think Mr. Ansip, you're referring to a specific technology that I mentioned on my slide 10, I suppose you will see the slide 10, and I put it on purpose on the same level as the additional hardware to enhance uh, smartphones. So that is and can be equivalent. The reason why I was, um, and, and actually the, the developers and proudly from, from Estonia proudly presents the certifications that they have achieved, and, and rightly so. Um, the point why I was pointing out on hardware is, and um, it is something with regard to user complexity and manageability for for users um, that don't look into, cannot look into all of those details. So I'm not, I wouldn't say that, um, wouldn't say that that what, what the split key scenarios do and should be replaced by hardware also. But I think we should make sure that certain things that are relevant for users, um, that there is a certain hardware limit that can make it easier for people to, to understand what is happening and what is happening where. But um, again, that refers to specific uh, technologies that we would need to look at in more, more detail. Um, Yes, I think the question on whether we would shy away private small providers, I think, is is um, something that, of course, national states need to decide on. Um, again, a parallel infrastructure, I think, is is useful. And I think that with that, I've probably used up my three minutes and all of the other questions that were addressed. I'm happy for more discussed and detailed discussion uh, later, but I think the answers will be much longer. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And now Thomas Loninger, also three minutes. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for those questions. I try to be brief. I'll also start with Mr. Armand. Um, so should it be a public good? I think it clearly needs to aspire to be that. Um, uh, particularly in Germany, I would point to the example of the Corona Van app, which was not just open source, but uh, really included the community and a similar approach should also be tackled here because that is one of the good ways in which we can to gain the trust of citizens. Um, Architecture-wise, we are speaking about a common standard which will ensure interoperability between member states. And because we are also aiming for technological neutrality, that's why, um, in my opinion, it is now the important job of the European Parliament to ensure that we have principle-based safeguards in the legislation, that no matter the technical implementation in any member state or the delegated acts that might change in the future, uh, we do ensure that this system is ensuring is a deserving of citizens' trust. This would be, for example, uh, protection against tracking. And we do have examples of, uh, for example, personal identifiers that are area-specific. Um, they could be also specific for every company that the user is interacting. Such systems do exist in several e-government systems in Austria. We have them for over 18 years. Um, that would be an easy fix. Then the question of Mr. Uh, Pexa, what is the one single measure that would increase security? I think there are many safeguards to consider, but the most important from my perspective is the unobservability of the system. 
Clearly, we don't want to use the system. Article uh, 6A, paragraph 7 uh, hints in that direction. So why not go the full mile? Why not create a system that will never allow any central entity to observe the transactions that are happening? Um, that would also address the question of Mr. Terrace, um, because, of course, such a pile of data about every time someone is identifying or attestating an attribute will create an interest of government entities and, and security uh, uh, bodies, but also foreign intelligence services. And just not having the system being data minimal in that regard would, I think, be the safest uh, solution that would, yeah, gain you applause from the privacy community. Um, and and um, that is also, you know, we're tackling the question about uh, the Dutch and German situation when it comes to Article 11a. Uh, we want to propose something um, that is up to the privacy standards so we cannot break the pr constitutional privacy provisions in some of the countries. I think it's clear that here a correct balance has to be struck. Um, um, the question of Ms. Dacia from ECR, um, and I, I think there is already a strong industry interest. We have seen that in the ID Austria system that was discussed over the past years, and I can tell you that I've never seen so much industry interest in using a government system to optimize speed, efficiency, and trust of uh, the systems of any corporation. And so I think um, uh, that's also why I believe this will be a powerful general purpose technology because there will be many uses for it. And lastly, the question of Mr. Alin on the browser security and the uh, Quox Article 45. Um, that is really a key issue. Um, what Article 45 currently foresees is that um, the certificates of member states have to be included in the list of root certificate authorities in the web browsers. That is breaking with uh, decades-long provisions on and, and standards in the industry on how to uphold the security uh, and the trust of the internet that we know. Um, there have been several attempts by uh, many countries to be included in that list, mostly for uh, the purpose of targeted and indiscriminate government surveillance, because uh, that would be allowed once you are in that list of trust stores. And there are very high criteria for any company to be included in there. Article 4 45 is not uh, in any way trying to create a level playing field here. It just says you have to be in there with every country. Um, and as we are talking here about a global feature, because it is very hard to foresee browsers that are just specifically created for Europe, that would be something that sets a global standard. Um, and I think in we don't want uh, the, the this proposal to um, create so many problems uh, particularly in the security and privacy community. Um, and everything that Article 45 attempts right now has been tried um, over many years under the, the, the banner of extended validation. Um, um, if you're old enough and technically versed enough, you'll remember in your address bar in your browser that you could see uh, the person that is owning the website. And all of the browsers, uh, uh, yeah, kind of kicked that feature down the window because it did not work and created more confusion. So I am really questioning uh, the, the legitimacy of Article 45, and I think it would be better, the proposal would be better without it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And now Ka Catalina Dodo for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for questions. And I will start with uh, the one uh, asking about the... Um, the right balance between regulation and uh, implementation at the local uh, in the local countries. Um, given the complexity of this uh, of this project and the very uh, technical aspects that uh, are. Um, hard to understood uh, by by people uh, outside the uh, outside industry i i do believe that uh, uh, a strong recommendation will be will be good in order to ensure a minimum level of uh, protection a minimum uh, level of uh, reliability of this uh, uh, system uh, and uh, that in my opinion should act not only as a minimum level but as a strong recommended level as to ensure that uh, countries will not go and uh, ex bring uh, this to an extreme you know to to have uh, uh, not too less not too much on uh, on the tooling and on the uh, development about uh, 
around this uh, this system having uh, two less of course we can uh, imagine that will uh, that will create big issues in data protection and security of the system and having too much will uh, at least prolong the implementation and will uh, limit the um, the access to the system itself by having it uh, not in time or not at all Therefore, uh, in in my opinion, this uh, recommendation that should be common is not should not be just um, a view. Should be really a, a strong uh, and detailed uh, uh, recommendation on how system should be minimally implemented, uh, and uh, maybe. Um, just uh, to to take one one more question on um, as the the time it's uh, very limited on the security measures uh, we shall consider as a first priority that access to this data shall be uh, limited and uh, first of course is to to protect uh, this data against uh, uh, unwanted uh, attackers which we all uh, see in these uh, days and we can uh, realize that such a system in every country and uh, at the european level might be uh, a, tar a very uh, visible target therefore uh, uh, from my perspective that would be the first thing to to do in perspective of uh, security of course uh, uh, there are uh, certain other measures but that i would see first to to, to ensure that this data will be really protected thank you uh, thank you, thank you uh, very much. And now we go to the second uh, round of our discussion. Uh, please be brief and concise. Uh, and we start with Angelica Nibler, one minute. Thank you very much. And my gratitude to all speakers, most interesting and complex. It's good that the committee should be taking time to discuss this. I have two questions. One was already mentioned by Mr. Loninger. I think we ought to consider whether we have best practice cases. The vaccination certificate, which was decided and applied throughout Europe in a few months, it's a great success story for the European Union. So my question is, what can we see by looking at this certificate of COVID vaccination? What can we learn from that amazing example, which can lead to some conclusions that we might draw? After all, we have many countries, the Baltic states, which are extremely progressive, the Scandinavian countries that have already collected a lot of experience. It would be really helpful if we had samples, examples to see what happened and so that we can build on the model for our work. And secondly, I'd like to mention the cyber security scheme theme, which has been interestingly uh, presented. It's good that we need a cyber security scheme for the wallet. We might call upon the Commission to uh, start the process, I think, Misa, and the constructor and all the stakeholders which are integrated in the process. There should be an agency which is predestinated to guide us when it comes to the rollout of this digital uh, era. Maybe one should ask this question whether they also think that INISA and the coordination and the various formats uh, of uh, cooperation and uh, exchanges within INISA, might it not be possible to produce this digital wallet more quickly for all our citizens? Thank you. The next speaker is Yasana Kutuyar. One minute. Ms. Kudahar, please press the speak button. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. Please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to all for this very interesting exchange on a very important initiative and topic. A trusted and secure digital identity for all Europeans is indeed a crucial step forward on the path for European digital decade, and most importantly, on simplifying citizens and enterprises' life and accessing services online and ensuring their data and the way they deem suitable for their needs. I'm currently working on the 2030 Digital Policy Programme that establishes, amongst other targets, concrete targets on the digitalization of public services. More specifically, the ambition is that by 2030, 80% of citizens will use digital ID. Do you think that as things stand now, this target is achievable? And secondly, I have another question in terms of data control. The European Commission has ensured that the European digital identity will give citizens and businesses full control of the data they want to share which is, according to your perspective, the best way to simplify the user experience of such a European solution as much as possible in order to really empower citizens in sharing their data and to also avoid that data protection is just a formal exercise. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, next speaker is Nicola Baer for one minute, please. Yeah, herzlichen Dank. Uh, Dank auch. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very important hearing. We know how complex this issue is, but there are lots of uh, ways of stopping money laundering, counter counterfeiting, and improving access to digital services and streamlining it. it. Um, a lot of people think that we can move beyond the uh, passwords and so on. So. This needs to be set out sensibly, and this is something several experts have said, which is why I've got a question on this. Now, perhaps we need to look more at what we can do now in terms of regulations for everyone across the EU, for all uh, areas, and that we need to make more differentiation for specific uses uh, such as security and privacy. And I'm bringing this up because in Frankfurt, where I'm from, I'm thinking about uh, the financial services and many stakeholders are saying to me that uh, the, the uh, demands are higher and they are finding issues with what's planned from the EU. So how can we reconcile that, particularly if uh, one system is supposed to be binding, where is liability if uh, uh, others re uh, are supposed to recognise and implement the system as those that did it previously. So how can we have high standards if uh, a payment mode is used, for example, where there's identification but where it, uh, it arises that there is abuse, something is being replicated, how can we make it, it possible if the location doesn't have to be ascertained. What do we, what do we do if a document is supposed to be withdrawn, but it can be used offline? In that way, you can't have uh, things as up to date as whether you uh, take a digital ID. And then there's a very simple issue: if you don't have to give the location, then how do I know who to transfer the money to? If uh, I'm supposed to transfer money, then I need to know where the person is that I'm supposed to hand the money on to. So my question is, uh, along the lines of uh, people talking about parallel systems, there are some already, but perhaps there are already higher standards, and uh, I wouldn't like to trim things down there. Hey, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, uh, stick to the time. Uh, uh, Madame Penkova, uh, one minute, please. Hello, I hope you can hear me and see me well. Perfect. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the speakers, for the expert presentations uh, they've given and the, the very aspects I looked at it. Of course, we very much welcome the proposal uh, for regulation on digital identity because it does address some of the shortcomings of uh, AIDAS and it improves effectiveness. And of course, the framework is extending its benefits to the private sector. I think we're all clear that the digital wallets will allow uh, consumers and businesses across the EU to use their uh, identities and have control on the personal data that has been uh, that has been shared which is a major improvement uh, I would like to address three main uh, questions so from the, based on the proposal we have now those questions are to the uh, to the experts I know we've touched upon some of the topics already um, so how do you think we can ensure the neutrality of technologies associated with the way identity is managed? Uh, second one, are you sure we're going to be able to, uh, to ensure the uh, interoperability of the systems? And uh, finally, is there a way to manage uh, better uh, the choice for consumers in, in terms of are we going to be able to have one uh, single wallet or we would need like multiple digital uh, wallets? This is more about the, the consumer experience and the trust in terms of what they're using. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Robert Ross is here for one minute. Thank you, Chair. And thanks to all speakers for their contribution. I'm very happy with the critical notes of Mr. Lonneke about the European Digital Identity Wallet because that is what we need. I only want solutions that serve our citizens. And that's why my question to Mr. Lonneke um, about the wallet is how and why does this wallet, wallet serve the EU citizens? I see big opportunities for government and industry, but what is the added value from the people's perspective compared to the current situation? And do these advantages outrage the enormous amount of data that government and companies collect and stores from our citizens? I even see a danger in that. The second question, how voluntary is the European digital identity wallet? But even more important, how voluntary will it remain in the future? Because the European Union always comes up with nice plans to eventually abuse it, to create more control. And a recent example is the Green Past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now Carlos Zorinho from one minute. Muito obrigado, Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm happy to be allowed to participate in this public hearing. Uh, this is a key issue in the European Union. We have to consider this fundamental uh, element of ensuring sovereignty in this move of technological advance. I was very happy to uh, consider th these new innovations in thousands of communities. I'm now in visiting the second phase of the AID and integrate the principle of single application. I think this is a, a single authentication, and I'd like to hear what your opinion is on the value of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Kumpola Natri, Socialist and Democrats. One minute. Thank you, Chair, and, and every speaker today. It is very important that we will do this right. So I also see that even I'm the one waiting this to offer Europeans more clarity and more 
power in their hands, what information to share, that we also dig into the systems and see how to make it uh, security and, and future proof even there. I think that uh, we have to also check the systems openly, like open it for the test hackers to, and, and uh, all the tracking prop possibilities, because at the moment what we see on the existing uh, rules uh, are there, GDPR, and happy to have the board here represented, we see that how easy it is that our data is tracked, it is uh, used for the targeted advertisement and it is analyzed by every keyboard uh, millisecond difference what we do online. So we cannot afford having this part of our identities to be lost and or to identify in the internet, but then the uh, make it right and good luck for everything. Uh, I think it is too many times mentioned implementation act. It is 78 times in this one and I, I thank at the same time the commission who was brave enough to give it out now but there is room to develop and, and I thank for the speakers there. One concrete question also maybe more for the commission or opinions of the speakers is that also the Digital Governance Act gave some ideas and rules how to govern the data and we created the Innovate Data Innovation Board, which is the multi-stakeholder and includes more societies on board. So that could be also the way added here that you have more uh, stakeholders involved when developing the standards and having it also the NGOs who will work hard to protect our uh, privacy and, and data. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And the last speaker is Francesca Donato, not a Dutch member. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, I'd like to, um, with, to draw the attention of all my colleagues uh, on the important concerns that uh, the experts have raised, starting from the the problem um, of uh, the, uh, the problem of the full control by the user of the device and the, of uh, his personal data, the possible abuse of the system uh, due to the absence of uh, uh, necessary safeguards, and the, also the risk of discrimination for people not using these digital ID services. So um, my idea is that uh, we are not ready for this uh, uh, dramatic innovation without a regulation, a previous regulation establishing a solid framework for the uh, individual private property of personal data with a strong set of safeguards against any possible breach of connected rights and any possible misuse of all devices with discrimination consequences. I remind everybody that haste is the enemy of good. So let's think over and take all the time we need to uh, create this framework. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, uh, two members who, who would like to take a floor in the catch of eye. So, um, because it's an important topic, so I give the floor now to Mr. Rope. One minute. Um, if not, then maybe to the next not speaker, like our... Okay, connected. Then Mr. Hoppe, please. Labadiena, visiems. Ačiū gerbimas pirmininkė. Ačiū pranešėjim pateikusiems informaciją apie, sakyčiau, labai svarbu klausimą. Thank you very much. Now, this is a very important issue that you've uh, dealt with here. Over the last few years, there have been a lot of issues of uh, data stealing from private people, private owners, private data has been stolen, and no one's done anything about this. There's been no kind of compensation and the internet 
is openly accessible for a lot of criminal activity. No one is protecting citizens. There are lots of new banking platforms, new banking programs are being introduced, and the security um, standards aren't that high. People can't carry out their business in a, in, in a way that ensures that uh, they're safe on the internet and banks can't be held responsible for issues. So that means that the internet is not safe and we have big issues with it. And we really need to take steps so that people are kept up to date so that they can carry out transactions safely online and so that people can be held responsible in terms of granting licenses. There needs to be monitoring and oversight. Consumers have to fight their own corner now and they have to fight their way through the rules, which is difficult. I hear that uh, Madame Leita or Marcus is not connected anymore. She wanted to take a flow. Is she connected? Not. If not, then we go to the to the, our expert uh, concluding remarks by expert. Uh, each uh, has uh, three minutes to answer. Yeah, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, everybody, for the questions that were addressed to uh, the, the, uh, all the experts. Uh, indeed, uh, there are good and bad experiences uh, uh, with, uh, um, the, in the past with using the, the electronic identity or uh, um, services uh, which are interoperable and which are based on the recognition of the uh, person. Uh, I would not overestimate uh, the experiences that we had with uh, green passports. Uh, first of all, uh, there are positive parts, like well-working interoperability, like the fact that uh, most of the standards are public and uh, we, we can check actually how this, uh, how this works. Also, the, from the point of view of the uh, European Data Protection Supervisor, the, uh, clar the clarity of the prepared implementing measures uh, was uh, uh, well uh, organized by the uh, European Commission and also the consultation process with the European Data Protection Supervisor. But at the same time, that was a very concrete project uh, which was uh, directed to one the, uh, direction only, so, so to give the possibility to, uh, um, uh, to restore the freedom of uh, uh, movement. And of course, there are the uh, problems with the reuse of this service for the other purposes. Although we have to make it clear that the member states were not hiding the fact that they want to use and reuse the green passports for the other uh, solutions. So uh, I, I stay um, uh, interested with this example, but uh, not overestimating that. And the second example for that uh, is the high standard. Of course, as the European Data Protection Supervisor, I call for high standard of security and data protection. But let's remember about the examples that we had, or rather the experience that we had with electronic signature directive in 1999, uh, where we, uh, in, we, our predecessors, have invented the wonderful standard that probably organizationally will, is a good solution, but the threshold which was given on those who are going to, pro to provide such a services and use these services was simply too high. And uh, the uh, short answer to the question about uh, the, the, uh, p the, the things that the, or, or the ordinary citizen would have from that, well, that's first of all interoperability of the, of the uh, ID solutions. And, and uh, with this amount of people who are traveling throughout Europe and who live in the other countries, uh, the necessity to have the special uh, ID, electronic ID for each country that you are in is simply outdated. These are not the solutions that we should uh, rely on uh, in the future. 
I, I'm surprised that there were no questions about the, the, the blockchain part of this uh, uh, regulation, uh, but of course we are ready to, to discuss this uh, problem as well. Um, thank you. Before I go def uh, give the floor to the next expert, there is uh, also Madame Adriana Mag Maldonado wanted to ask the questions. Yeah, please, uh, you have a one. Sí, buenos días, ¿me oyen? Uh, Ms. Maldonado, please uh, press the speak button once. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I will continue in, in Spanish. Bueno, en primer lugar... Eh... Uh, Celine, we've had the ENCO opinion in this report regarding the digital thing, uh, fingerprint. I'd like to thank everyone that's spoken. All these issues are very important and the various different points that we've had uh, regarding the change to the regulation regarding the issues pertaining to security and privacy of data of European consumers we had an interesting statistic, which is that there are lots of European countries which aren't le legally equipped to have this digital fingerprint. So I'd like to ask speakers this, that we've heard this morning, what can we do to make sure that uh, consumers in Europe will actually use this tool? And that needs to be trust-based. We have a lot of capacity to uh, transmit information uh, safely, but we need to get European consumers to use these tools and that will be good for all uh, agents involved. So how can we make sure that European consumers work uh, safely and in a trustworthy way and that they have trust in these applications? And then there's another point that's important, which is evaluating these measures how can member states make sure we're all pulling in the same direction in terms of European digital identity? Uh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. And now we go back to our expert, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ferro, for, uh, uh, for one minute, uh, three minutes. Thank, thank you, thank you. So. I noted the question on a security certification and collaboration with ENISA. So for sure, ENISA could help uh, to, to, to bridge the gap uh, needed to, to have a complete security certification for wallet. Uh, standardization activities are already ongoing at SEN to develop methodologies that could be used in a future European cyber security uh, scheme being for code uh, and other things. Uh, also, this uh, question about uh, the objective of 80% of digitalization by 2030, I personally think that it's totally achievable. If you look, at, for instance, at the uh, mobile phone is a wonderful tool and very versatile, so it would be easy to develop solutions based on that. And also, I noticed that uh, they are all equipped with uh, secure hardware, and in the future, uh, for, within a few years, for sure, it will be 100%. So it will also be possible to leverage on the secure element on a mobile phone in the very near future to offer a high level of security. Uh, question with regards to data protection, is it just, can, can we only rely on the, on the user to ensure data protection, uh, relying on its consent? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I have been pointing the issue with the electronic attestation provider, for which there is no requirement of data, data protection certification, so this should be made mandatory. There, is also, there are also the issue of territoriality of data, so this is an important point if we want to protect data. Data. There is also the issue of the data of legal persons, if we want to protect uh, our legal persons from extraterritorial laws. And also a particular point of uh, data, data protection certification, I think is the first text that mandates such, uh, such, such things. It's a very pro uh, uh, step forward. We welcome it, but uh, methodology are needed. Uh, and for sure, the EDPB uh, should, should be here and should provide support. Um, 
I also saw the question with regards to wallet. Would there be one or several wallet? Uh, personally, as a plaintiff in the industry, I don't have the answer. I think it's more in the member state remit. But from what I see, I see it that it seems to be different philosophies where some member states would rather like to have a wallet where all the features are on the uh, user device in the in the hand of the users while some other would prefer to have the features split it where some some feature would be on the wallet some would be provided on the server and in that aspect uh, industry doesn't have any opinion huh? it's up to the member state however from a security perspective as a security industry we we highlight that this may have security concern and in that case it's very important in our eyes to make sure that both parts of the wallet, user device, server side, are securely bound to mutual authentication. They should be paired uh, in order to ensure the security of the whole system. And if this architecture is to be retained, which I think is the case, I think provision in the text to mandate secure peering between two pieces of the wallet should be included in the regulation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And now, Professor Ranberg. Also three minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for all these and questions. I think what the questions showed already is that we have a number of conflicting requirements also in, in the room. And and so what can we learn from that? I think the first thing is trying to learn from the and green pass activity is difficult as uh, the EDPS has already uh, pointed out because the nice thing about the Green Pass was it was a very concrete application. And whenever we need to do a security or privacy assessment, when we have a very concrete application and we can do a very concrete risk assessment and then things are much easier. So from that point of view, it's probably good to have a few more examples of very concrete application areas to gain experience. Um, but it will not help us too much for the general and for the general solution. Um, for the general solution, it may be useful to look at some of the histories of how wallets developed and how internet communication has developed. And what we can see is it is difficult but possible to identify things more and to bind things more. It is much more difficult and almost impossible once you have a binding already set between two certain things, once you've identified somebody, to achieve something like unobservability back and to achieve an privacy back. So from that point of view, one should start with a relatively lightweight solution that has um, Definitely, and now I come back to my to the question that I didn't answer in the first round. What is my biggest wish? My biggest wish is that we don't impact on observability. We need to get rid of this observance an issue and the identification really is a kind of risk when it comes to identity management, the mandatory identification. So we need to actually have something which is much more lightweight, which allows users to move forward and backward attributes as they need it and to show it. And if relying parties have higher requirements, a banking example was mentioned, then maybe that should stay um, that should stay in extra infrastructure for specific purposes. And what we may need to remove then is the, let's say, requirements that the and financial sector needs to use this light white wallet because a light white wallet is maybe for something else. And in future, I think we will have um, several credentials and several wallets still in our pockets that we need to work with. Um, trying to get the full integration is is not something that we should um, that we should aim for because we will only create all kinds of and um, all kinds of. Um, contradictions between the, let's say, financial sector requirements, for example, and the health and health and, and sector and, and social media and requirements. So, again, make make sure that we have high security, but that we have low collection of, of data and very good unobservability, non-mandatory identification, unique identification, and then we can build something on that on a voluntary measure. In, ask, working with ENISA is a good idea. We shouldn't forget that the European standardization organizations with which ENISA, ENISA is also working, but certainly as a commission, the commission should ask ENISA for many of these kind of things um, to work with when it works with uh, private sector indeed, when SENSENELEC and other organizations are important. Um, thank you very much. Now, Thomas uh, Loninger, three minutes. Thank you very much. 
Um, I will also start with uh, the EU COVID-19 digital certificate, the Green Pass. Um, because I was present there, I was following the dossier very closely and uh, we could be involved also with the drafting. And I'm very happy with the solution that we've achieved here. That's, I would, that's why I would like us to learn from this experience. Um, yes, uh, that proposal was solving a very specific problem. And the European, the European digital identity wallet tries to be much broader in the general purpose infrastructure. Uh, but we have to be honest that this system will include health attributes in the future. Um, medication and vaccination certificates are foreseeable attributes. Uh, if we would have another health emergency of the scape of COVID-19 pandemic in a few years, and EIDAS is he already here, the wallet app would be the first thing we look towards to um, verify these things. So do we really want to adopt something that has a lower privacy standard. Uh, for us, observability from a central entity really is one of the core questions that uh, we will ask in assessing how privacy respecting the overall proposal is. And I think we've proven that this is doable and the technology is out there. Um, and we, in general, if we look closer for the safeguards that are missing, we have to think from um, the final way that this product uh, will be used. And I agree with the previous speakers in that regard. Um, and it was mentioned that domestic use cases were always on the horizon. And I want to point to the example of the Netherlands, which extended the EU COVID-19 digital certificate with a domestic system that only gives a daily green or red QR code. That is perfect for domestic use because I'm no longer then uh, um, uh, allowing a bartender or uh, a restaurant owner to know if I'm vaccinated or recovered or have been tested. That kind of medical data is no longer shared in such a system. So we really have to think from the end what the system will be used for, and that includes really looking closer towards the relying parties. Yes, the banking sector is interesting because they know your customer requirements there are very strong, and it's understandable why companies uh, um, want to know more and want to be sure that what they know is correct. And now we come to the critical point. Revocation is a big question for them. So if my name changes, if my driver license is revoked for some reason, um, then they might want to have live information about that. That is really tricky from a point of privacy. Um, do we want that same feature also for a credit scoring company or a newspaper where I have a subscription? So we really have to think whether a one-size-fits-all solution is really fitting for all relying parties. And if we disagree on that point, an interoperability will become very tricky. So that leads me to the important suggestion that rushing this proposal would be very dangerous. We need to get this right. It is far too important. And we want to have the trust of citizens. Why am I so much focusing on the EU COVID-19 certificate? Because it was a system that created distrust, like the Corona One app, the exposure notification framework that happened 2020. Those were systems that deserve the people's trust. That's why they were so widely adopted, which is the ultimate goal of this proposal as well. And that leads me to the final questions that I'm trying to answer, which is, if we really want users to be in control, then we need non-discrimination provisions. Then we need the choice to use this app to be free. And we want a European system to not be like the cookie banners that just been declared illegal. We don't want this to be a dark pattern where users are trained to just click yes, because that's the only way to participate in society and use services. Um, Consent and control needs to mean more with this system because we are talking about the most important aspects about our lives, our identity. And so I really hope that we can get this right. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And now uh, Catalina Dodo, Madame Dodo, please, three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for this very intense and uh, good conversation. I will start by uh, by answering to one of the the questions on the advantages for uh, for citizens. I do believe that uh, with such a system, uh, there are clear advantages that uh, that are uh, for uh, for individuals in terms of uh, uh, easiness of uh, accessing different uh, services especially public ones and in terms of traveling, moving from one place to another. And uh, somehow at a different scale, at a, in a private environment uh, with uh, wallets for different other uh, uh, um, environment, uh, 
people started to to use and uh, see the advantages of having such uh, such an uh, environment so uh, moving to to the next level and having an identity wallet of course it's different uh, but it's uh, the next natural step and uh, i do see a big advantage for citizens and i do see their uh, a good willingness to to use it of course as long as we uh, uh, protect and we offer them a trustful system um, also um, one important point that i do see in regards to the system is that while uh, should be let's say optional or free choice for citizens to to use it and to uh, enroll their data uh, should be mandatory for uh, for institutions to accept this uh, this wallet and uh, of course i'm coming with different experiences from different countries but uh, therefore uh, there is a reality in this aspect that uh, not uh, uh, all institutions are uh, easily accepting electronic uh, uh, id or even when they do exist or uh, even a electronic signature that it's not easy accepted by uh, by institutions so i think this is important to be clear and to be set up as a, a mandatory fact and uh, of course uh, one third element in my uh, closure is that uh, we shall reuse the experience that we have already either from these uh, systems that uh, been developed uh, for certain purposes which of course are easier to be um, understood are easier to be protected easier to be uh, to be developed and uh, accepted uh, but uh, still we we do have in this uh, in this area uh, quite a history in uh, terms of uh, ident electronic identities in Europe. So therefore, I think uh, we have experience in the private sector, in uh, uh, even public in, uh, in some countries that uh, we can reuse and we can have the system as a, a good one for, uh, for the citizen, uh, which is the, actually the, the main uh, wish for, uh, for it. Thank you very much for having me here and let's have a good system. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much. And now I give you also the floor to the to the Commission, to Mr. Norbert Zagstetter from DG Connect, um, to comment uh, uh, on our discussion. Thank you very much, Chair. Good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you this morning, and I'm here with a team who's listening to the conversation. This has been a very good and very substantial conversation uh, for us, and uh, I can tell you that uh, many of the points that you have uh, shared today are, are really the core of our concern and uh, are the core of the concern of the proposal. We believe that this proposal is a step change for citizens for use. It will offer a system which is voluntary to use, which is free to use, and which is under full user control. It will have proved the availability of digital identity. It will make create a system which can be usable in the private as well as in the public sector. And it is a system which is fully geared towards data protection. So we see a system that is uh, has a huge advantage for the user, but also for business, because it creates opportunities with being able to share attributes and certificates. It's a strategic proposal also that ensures the possibility of governments in Europe to identify their citizens in the digital sphere. Let me come to one point that you have highlighted in the uh, discussion today, and which was, uh, I think, in the centre of many of uh, your interventions, which is privacy and data protection. I think uh, this is our firm belief in the Commission. Uh, we have invested uh, a lot into this uh, in this area. We believe that this proposal presents very strong and solid safeguards. We have data protection requirements that require uh, that require functional and structural separation for the issuers of the wallet for the for for identity providers we require registration for service for uh, relying parties we also have in fact a number of areas which you have uh, mentioned in the presentation uh, very well anchored in the proposal selective disclosure is a basic uh, development feature of the wallet data minimization as you know is a fundamental element of the gdpr the wallet will be gdpr certified we propose cyber security certification of the whole the wallet uh, so we, we strongly believe that uh, the security element, the trust element, the trust and security element, which is key to the uptake by the citizen, is uh, a core part of this proposal. And we are certainly uh, very interested in your views 
on that, let me just say, I think what you have said as well is that implementation is core uh, for this proposal. In particular, the European Data Protection Supervisor has pointed to that. I can tell you that we have uh, a process. We have, I think, the opportunity of parallel process, which is the toolbox exercise. We have an EIDAS expert group who is working on a possible uh, implementation. And uh, these works of this group is, by the way, entirely transparent. Their documents are on the expert group website. We have several documents there, and we will create a dedicated state called a platform in the month of February, where we will publish the first major deliverable, which is the outline of the future technical architecture and reference framework for stakeholder feedback. So this is a proposal which focuses on the highest level of security. And I say this in particular for the colleagues who are close to the banking sector. We have very positive feedback from the financial sector. We are not uh, intending to dominate the market with a single wallet, but we are intending to provide a product which satisfies the highest levels of security and trust. A final word, which I would like to share with you you on uh, QWAX. Uh, I must say that I agree with some of the interventions in here, qualified website authentication certificates. QWAX is a possibility for transparency and security in the internet. It is enforcing a regulation and a proposal which has been there since 2014. And I do not agree with claims here that uh, this would uh, challenge security in the, in the internet and disrupt current practices. This is according to the European Commission's point of view, simply not true. And that the motivations that web browsers have for such approaches are actually quite uh, public in this sense. I would le leave it at that, if you agree, Chair, and we are certainly available for any future engagement and the conversation on this proposal. Thank you very much. Um, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I give the floor to, to Ms. Rapporteur, uh, Madam Jerkovic, for three minutes for conclusion. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Today is a single market uh, remains highly fragmented and we can all agree that um, the digital identity under EIDAS uh, has not achieved uh, its potential in terms of its effectiveness and its ability to push Europe uh, in an age of a true digital citizenship where our personal data, fundamental rights and uh, freedom um, are protected and respected uh, in the digital sphere like they are in the physical world. Um, protection of personal data lies at the core uh, of this proposal. It is its uh, DNA, uh, so to speak. And that is why I look very positive on the fact that uh, it will be mandatory for the digital world to be notified at a level uh, of assurance high. Um, I see a lot of potential in using digital wallets as a tool to address the question of excessive data processing and for reducing our uh, digital uh, footprint uh, online. This is a particularly relevant in relation to big tech platforms which uh, aggregate and process uh, uh, massive amounts of personal data with the, the end goal to monetize on them. Um, Public-private uh, partnership that will know how to reconcile uh, public and corporate uh, interests will be essential enabler of this uh, paradigm uh, shift. And finally, I believe that the success of this legislation will rest on our ability to uh, create uh, a critical mass of users. And to uh, achieve this, we must, take, we must make the, the digital uh, wallet secure and easy to use. Uh, security will have to go hand uh, in hand with the usability and uh, accessibility. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for this very interesting uh, conversation, discussion, and it concludes this item. Uh, so uh, I propose we make a five minutes break and go to, to the next one. Yeah, if you, no.